Um, we're going to learn that lethal viral necrosis is not new to Florida. It's just um, present in Southwest Florida. So I want to reach out and say thank you, Fabian and Javier from Amerescape uh, for joining us today so you can educate us and our HOAs and condo associations who all have St. Augustine and um, are having, or hopefully don't have to deal with this, but I know that some are. So I'd like to introduce uh, Fabian Gamez, our, uh, he was the president of Amerescape. Uh, Fabian, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about Amerescape and your presence here in Southwest Florida. Thank you, Laura, and thanks everyone for the opportunity. Um, I'm one of the owners, we're locally owned uh, landscape company here in Southwest Florida. And we've worked with Castle ever since they came over from the East Coast. So when they first had their presence here on the West Coast, we've been working alongside them with the community in Fort Myers and we've been working with them very well ever since. So we appreciate the opportunity. And mm -hmm. yes, uh, I'm, I'm gonna introduce uh, Javier and we're gonna talk about this, but I, I wanna start off by saying, you know, this is informational. Uh, this is not to cause any stress or alarm. We're going to give you just the facts and we're going to provide you with all the information supporting what's being discussed in this meeting. So once again, thank you for the opportunity. And I want to introduce Javier uh, Pineda. He's our uh, senior account manager. He's and also our licensed pest holder, which is the one that's been diligently gathering a lot of this information so that we can present to you guys. Wonderful. Thank you, Fabian. All right, Javier, are you ready to, to start educating, <laughs> letting us know all about this? Yes. Uh, like Fabian said, you know, this is just information. I mean, it's been going on since 2014 when it was first found in Boynton Beach, Florida, and it's just grown over the years. Um, more so recently, now that it's basically in our neighborhoods, in Collier as well in Lee County, which we currently actually are. I have it actually, the only thing that advised me, the our community from the other communities, basically a double highway, you know, in between us. So there's, I know in that particular, you know, community, there's panic about lethal necrosis. So we can just talk about lethal necrosis. What is lethal necrosis? Basically is, uh, is a disease that uh, is affecting Floritan, the St. Augustine variety. Uh, and once it gets into your lawns, uh, it can basically eradicate your lawns within three years, as quickly as one year and a half, once it's found in the lawns. So there is no fungicides. There's nothing we can you know, treat it with to slow it down or cure the lawns. It is basically once it gets into your lawns, it's just a matter of time before not just one specific lot, but the entire community basically is going to end up have to, you know, losing the, all the lawn. Uh, the good thing about it is not that it's good, but, you know, it's, it's very easy to identify. You know, the chlorosis on the, on the leaf blades basically gives you the resemblance of the food of uh, or the, the lawn needing food. You know, which typically you eat grass is yellow, so it needs nitrogen. Well, in this case, it is uh, it is yellow elongated spots on the leaves, which is different from uh, lawn being uh, hungry for for fertilizer. So it can easily easily be identified. Uh, and typically, you know, once it starts dying back, it continues to grow. You know, on until basically there's no no Floritan or no San Diego seed left behind. Uh, so the uh, the good thing about this is it's only affecting one specific uh, type of Floritan or San Augustine, you know, and there's hope in the, you know, in the, in the horizon as far as, you know, options for, for this disease, as far as uh, replacement. There is, of course, unfortunately, no cure. You know, uh, uh, one of the pathologists when I was as the last FPMA uh, back in February, where this is basically where I learned that it was now in Lee County. It says this is basically, you know, all new to us. We're learning. And this is just, you know, uh, he gave a example. He goes, this is like when we first started dealing with COVID. This is basically yeah. COVID on grass. He goes, what did we, we didn't know anything about it. 
uh, you know, so we took precautions and did things that they were recommending. And this is basically, as we're going to learn, this is going to be things that, you know, we're going to try to do to slow it down. But at the end, I mean, there's, you know, no cure for this type of grass. Javier, so when you say that only on specific types of St. Augustine, I didn't realize there were different types of St. Augustine. Yes, for example, Seville is another type of St. Augustine, except it's a, that's a dwarf grass. We also have Cometo, Citra Blue. Uh, there's like eight different species of, uh, of uh, St. Augustine. They're just different, uh, different types, and some of them are being affected by it, and, and others are not. And how, uh, would, how would a manager know what type of St. Augustine they have? Would their landscaper know that automatically? By looking at it, your ninety nine percent of the lawns in in Southwest Florida are are St. Augustine lawns. You know that right. was typical. That's typical of most of the uh, developers that they plant. Uh, high end communities, you know, major focal areas may have uh, zosia grass. Zosia grass is a, is a thin bladed lawn. That's also a species that. Uh, is resistant and also it's not a host for lethal necrosis. Uh, a lot of the companies staying away from that because of the costs involved to maintain it. It has to be mowed differently, it has to be fertilized differently, it has to be watered differently. So the cost will be a lot higher to maintain. In, in, uh, you know, in comparison to uh, St. Augustine, they, they currently every lawn in Florida has it. Okay, and it's specifically the species that, or the this type of St. Augustine that's susceptible to the viral necrosis? That is correct, yes. Okay. A Floritan is? The Floritan basically is the, the, the species of St. Augustine that- Okay. So, so, as far as how lethal necrosis spreads is basically uh, one of our major, you know, corporates of all this is going to be unfortunately our morse. Every lawn in Florida has to be mowed, and because the disease lives in the leaf blades, and the sap basically is is what it transmits from one location to another. So the moment the leaf blades are are broken in half. The sap is now available to be basically attach itself to our mowers that are on top of our lawns on a daily basis mowing our lawns. Also our edge blades and our string trimmers. So, you know, a couple other recommendations is uh, minimize traffic on your lawns if you don't need to. Uh, minimize not mowing your lawns, you know, after a heavy rainfall, which that's gonna be very challenging in Florida because of the amount of rain that we get. And, and, uh, the way they transmit the cell, basically the sap attaches to a, a tire, a, a edger blade or a string trimmer. So once the uh, virus basically, or the leaf blades is cut and the, and the leaf blades dry off, the virus no longer lives inside the, uh, the leaf clippings. Cause that was one question. Do we have to start removing all the clippings from the lawns? No, you do not. You just have to allow enough time for the clippings to die off. And basically the virus basically also dies. It is still present in any live tissue that's out in the lawns. So that's why it's important also, you know, to do visual inspections, you know, of your communities looking for the specific uh, symptoms and determine whether do I have that virus. And if always, you know, you're second guessing yourself, the University of Florida has labs throughout most of Florida that can do a quick test and be able to get back to you within five days and determine whether you have the virus present in your lawn or not. And uh, especially if it's at the beginning stages of, you know, of the virus. And how do you find the labs? Are they, is there a website? There's a, there's a link. I can have Marissa forward you the yeah. link. And okay. basically can... those locations, um, you basically have to send you your uh, tissue sample so the way they recommend is do it an overnight, uh, collect as many lift plates as possible, including some of the uh, runners or, and then put them inside a uh, plastic bag at, 
and wrap them in uh, a wet napkin so that they stay hydrated and then send them overnight so that they get to the lab the next day. Okay. Thank you. Laura, Laura, I'd like to interject on here. So this is something that is typical. Uh, we do, uh, you know, your landscapers are already familiar with most of your larger landscapers or, or uh, pest control companies will be familiar on, on sending in tissue samples. So okay. it's not something that's new to this. We, we typically do soil samples you know, once a year, quarterly, depending on the contracts, uh, we'll, we'll do that on flower beds just to check the nutrients. This one would be uh, different. So if you're using, your landscapers using vendors such as Site One, there's different uh, types of vendors. So most of your vendors will know. You talk, if, if they have a landscaper, say, hey, if we want to test this area, most of them will know okay. how to do this. Yeah. So like we said, I mean, uh, there's, there's symptoms that we can, you know, they identified. Uh, the biggest one is going to be the, you know, the striping of the leaf place on the, on the leaf, you know, the floor tan. That's going to give you a first, a first, you know, a uh, heads up on it. Secondly, is going to be where the lawn basically starts to die back and turning brown and, and I know the first reaction is basically because this particular virus also reflects two other diseases. One of them is going to be brown patch, but brown patch, for example, only happens in the cool months of the year, which is going to be primarily from uh, October to about February, depending on the, you know, how the temperatures, the temperature basically has to be ideal for that particular fungus. So they have to be below 70 degrees. So anytime your mornings are, below 70, 65 and, and lower, then those are gonna be ideal for the, you know, for that disease to be present. Take call happens also seasonally. It happens every year in the same spot. That one's a little more challenging to identify, but in order to get confirmation for, for take all, basically you would have to remove uh, leaf blades as well as runners and send them off to a lab to get 100% confirmation on it. So, Take off, for example, the leaf blades turn brown, they die off, and then it slowly starts growing out if, you know, and if it's left untreated. The difference between these three diseases is take all and uh, brown patch are treatable. Uh, lethal necrosis is not. I mean, you can throw all the fungicide you want on it, but it's not going to do anything to slow down the symptoms. It's just going to continue to grow. So, so management, you know, there's recommendations from the University of Florida as far as uh, management. This is not going to, you know, it's not going to stop it from coming into the community. But it's like when first, you know, when kind of COVID, you know, three years back, I mean, everybody wear a mask. Well, this is something similar. You know, we're trying to do preventive uh, measures to slow down the spread of it because it's just basically a matter of time before it gets into your community. And... Uh, one of the expectations is that, you know, in 10 years, all of Florida is going to have their site replaced, you know, well, away from it. What are they, what are they going to go to, you know, <clears throat> as far as uh, one of the questions that we had prior to was what is the best choice after St. Augustine grass is, have, you know, is removed from Florida lawns? It's uh, palmetto sod. It's, palmetto sod was developed, developed by the, uh, probably, it's been in the market for like probably like 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now that we have started encountering lethal necrosis, it was tested for lethal necrosis. It is resistant to it. It, it can be a host, but it will not kill the, the, the species. So lethal, lethal necrosis may still be present, but it's not going to have any effect on the lawn. It's not going to kill it back. It's not going to basically, you know, you, the community will not have it to replace it again. There is... I know there's communities out there they have bahia grass, you know, like on their late embankments mm -hmm. or on open areas. This is just something to be aware of that if you transition it from bahia into any of the other species, bahia is, is a host, but it's, it will not die from it. It's just something to make you aware, you know, the, the, the managers aware of it, that it, it will not die from lethal necrosis, but it is a host, which means the virus can live on the 
particular species of, of uh, bahia. And bahia typically is used in uh, embankments because, you know, it can survive drought. And then as soon as rainy season comes back in, it starts turning green again. So, so that's just one, you know, just for everybody to be aware that it is a host, but it doesn't die from the leconecrosis. Okay. Where Zosia is neither a host or does not die also from leconecrosis. Where Pomero can be a host, but it will not die from it. Similar to Bahia. Okay. So as far as preventive you know, measurements, measures, uh, because our mowers are one of the pieces of equipment that spends the longest time on our lawns, it is recommended that you disinfect tires, blow off all the leaf clippings, especially when you move it from one community to another uh, to minimize the possibility of transmission. You spray your deck underneath your blades. Uh, and basically, you know, the guys that are doing your edging and your string trimming, spray down their piece of equipment, uh, also the string trimming, and then have them spread their, their shoes. Even though it's been it's been talked about that, that because the uh, shoes are not abrasive, so there's very, very slow possibilities of the shoes breaking the leaf blades. It's mostly the machines that are going to break the leaf blades, the fact that, that they're mowing and they're cutting the lawn, or when they're turning, they basically are, you know, are breaking the leaf blades. They have the highest possibility of being a host, you know, from moving the, the disease from one spot to another location. And then as far as uh, identifying the location, if you do find a location, they recommend that you basically isolate those locations. If it's a house, two houses, basically isolate them uh, and, and leaving toward the end of the week before they, you know, the finishing moment for the week. And if you do have to service, let those houses be the last thing that you do mow to minimize the possibility of spread. You know, and then, this is a, uh, and this is because of uh, all the, the, you know, the media. There's, you know, how Rhonda has been in the media so much. One thing that the University of Florida is the fact that the virus only survives in tissue is that you do basically spray down. If you've identified a lawn, spray down the lawn, kill the grass with Roundup, basically because it's a systemic is going to go right into the leaf blades. And the virus cannot survive in the soil. And basically, that's another way to manage that particular area so that it basically, the moors, you know, or somebody may, may step on it or, or go on it, uh, is going to basically deter the possibility of, of that house being, you know, the cause of a, you know, quicker spread in the community. Okay. So once it's been identified, then the recommendation is that you spray it with Roundup, kill that small area, and then at that point decide where you're gonna go with sod replacement or what type? Yes. Would you hope that if it's a small enough area, if you kill that area with Roundup, that the St. Augustine would, since it does have the little feeder bands, that it would fill in? Kind of like the brown, you know, uh, No, because of the susceptibility of the floor tan, even if it grows back and you already identify in the community, is very unlikely gonna probably pop up in other locations um, because it is difficult to manage. I mean, you can spray areas to kill that specific location back, but the unlikeliness of that, you know, keeping it from spreading is very, very minimal. So cost, looking at it from a cost stand, you know, perspective, if you kill off a small area, um, and this is, a, let's say it's a large scale association that it, you know, St. Augustine's everywhere. Um, and you've identified a couple of homes that have some spots. What, it, what are you recommending doing with, with killing with the Roundup and then replacing it with, you know, a few pieces of... If you identify, you know, individual homes that uh, the entire line needs to be replaced, then definitely, you know, transition, definitely do not replace any more floor time. If you, because of the fact that it is it's dying from... Uh, lethal necrosis, your best choice is going to be palmetto. Now, you know, we'll share a list of uh, farms that do are certified to be desist free because they actually test their lawns. There's, you know, the farms uh, ensuring that there's not any disease in the, in the lawns. So 
that would be your best choice. Go to Floor Tan and basically buy it from a uh, trust, you know, trustable sod farm that basically certifies every pallet of sod coming out of their farm. And if you look closely at the, you know, the on the top left here, mm -hmm. there's uh, basically one of the, you know, one of the tags on top of the pallet. But basically, and the reason it's on top of that pallet is because there's there has been certified that that particular grab particular pallet coming in is disease free and has been tested as having having no you know as lethal virus having no effect on that particular grass type of grass. Plus, also keeping, they go a step above that. They're basically, because floor time is still the largest production in Florida and Palmetto is being planted on those fields, they're also certifying that there is no Florida tan coming into your community that could possibly have, you know, mixed lawn and that can possibly bring in the disease as well. So I know that started over on the other coast, on the East Coast, correct? Is that yes. where the first case was found? So have yeah. they transitioned over there most of their lawns? Back to... in 2014, I think it was in Boynton Beach. That's where mm -hmm. it first started. I know, I know there's, from that, there's a lot of, you know, uh, Wellington, it was, a, a, I think, one of the other places that was affected from that. Now we have, you know, Pinellas. I know we have Collier positive locations everywhere and then uh lee county also has multiple locations that are have been identified as having the disease i know one particular community on in uh, gateway district is actually already in the process of replacing their lawns with palmetto okay and what is palmetto running cost wise right now from these farms and are is it available uh, it is available, and on the list that we'll provide, those are the, those are the top farms that do have a palmetto available, you know, to the public uh, on a large scale already because of the uh, the uh, virus being around in Florida now for you know for quite a few years, ten years or so. It is uh, it is being uh, planted a lot more. So uh, roughly, I would say if you can anticipate, you know from removal to finishing, to laying down your sod, because they do recommend that you do remove, even though you kill the floor time, that you do remove it more aesthetically than anything else. You know, because at the end, I mean, you, you have an investment, so you want to make sure that your lawns are going to go back, at, you know, and look, you know, nice. Okay. So I would say that you're running about, you know, in the 600s plus on a pallet of uh, replacing. The one thing to keep in mind that uh, your typical floor tan runs 500 square feet. Palmetto is only available in a 400 square feet. So that's why you see you're paying a little more for that because of, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know the reason behind it is because they're trying to, you know, it's all about the bottom dollar on it. But, you know, so they only put a 400 square feet. He's referencing the, uh, the pallet size. Every pallet is um, either, they either come in 400 or 500 square foot, depending on how they uh, are done at the sod farms. Okay. And, so. Versus floor tan, which you said is 600. 500. 500, 500. okay. Yeah. So when you're putting together the RFP, make sure you're looking at what size the pallet is, is what you're saying. Yeah, so one of the, yeah, definitely. And one of the things is, um, you know, that's the whole purpose of having this now so that your managers and your communities can be proactive because I know there's sod replacement being done on a regular basis on most of our communities whether you have, you know, sign work done at the front entrance and now you've got to put sod in or people are putting pools in and some of your bylaws may may reference that you have to use floor tam St. Augustine. Yeah, uh, that's where Pelican, Pelican uh, preserve one of the communities that we manage. That was how their bylaws were written. So the board had, you know, as we pre presented it to them, they had to uh, come up with a rule that they had to, they could use an alternative. Even Palmetto would be an alternative. So it, it's just something that, you know, like Javier says, it's it's not if if it's going to come, it's when it comes. So let's have this information now so that we can have these discussions or the communities and the managers can have these discussions with their communities. Hey, we were already scheduled to put, you know, X amount of uh, square feet of pallets uh, this year. Uh, should we consider an alternative? Let's start having these discussions now. So that's that's one of the main reasons. Uh, be behind this meeting so that they can make an informed decision 
and not wait three or four years. And then, hey, now my community and the entire lawn has to be replaced. What right. are my options? Right. Do it in phases. And then look at your documents. I'm glad you brought think, that up. Reminded me on that. Look at what your documents say. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and then one of the things is to, that the Florida, the University of Florida is recommend is stay away from Florida altogether. And this is where, you know, your bylaws come into play because, you know, they, they need to be changed so that there's an alternative replacement for it. You know, as far as uh, aesthetically, you, you will see a difference, you know, because this is a question that some of the other, web, you know, informative webinars that we've done, and I did one for the master board in Pelican. This is one of the things they ask. He goes, well, what's the difference between Palmetto and Florida? Well, Florida, Palmetto is going to be a lot smaller. So if you, if you put a replaced 10 pallets in the middle of a large field, you will see the difference. So that's one of the things that they have to take into consideration. But at the same time, it's like, why are you going to replace Florida knowing that there's a problem? You know, let's start bringing in Palmetto so that when our lawns do get infected in that community, the only thing that's basically going to survive is the Palmetto. Everything else will die back. One of the questions was, is the cure worse than the disease? But there is no cure. So we do know that. Um, yeah, there's nothing in, uh, from Sidewine, who's, who's a nationwide uh, vendor for chemical and stuff like that. Uh, and the reason that nobody's looking, in, looking into it, for one, there's Florida is the bait, Florida and Texas, I believe they're some of the major uh, states that use Florida in comparison to everything else north of us, you know, they use uh, uh, Bermuda and Georgia. Yeah, we yeah. use Bermuda and Georgia. Mm -hmm. So so he goes, so they really, it's not cost effective for any of the chemical companies to invest millions and millions of dollars into something that's basically only affecting, you know, a small portion of the nation. So, so there is, the good thing about, the other good side of it is, there is substitute for replacement that can keep our lungs, you know, alive you know, as far as a different species. So, so I asked, I asked them, I go, so is there any, anything in the horizon for, you know, doing any research? He goes, nobody that I talked to has any plans to do it. So basically they're, they're not going to invest millions of dollars into something that, you know, it's only minimal to, to the whole nation. So. Um, I've got some questions coming in. Um, <laughs> Mary asks, how does Citra Blue compare to Floritam? So, so Citra Blue, um, in comparison to Floritam, it well, it is, uh, it can tolerate shade better uh, than Floritam can. Uh, it's a little, it's more dry resistant once it gets established in your lawns in comparison to Floritam. Uh, it's also more resistant to like brown patch, you know, that, that get, affects uh, uh, Floritan. So it can tolerate the uh, brown patch a little better. Uh, it seems to have, you know, unless a lot of the feedback they've gotten, it seems to have a, a darker green color in comparison to Floritan does. So the color is also a little better. Uh, the one thing that uh, is very susceptible to is uh, caterpillars. Caterpillars can eat large portions of your grass very quickly if not treated, you know, t in a timely manner. With Citra Blue? Yes. Okay, so is that why um, your recommendation is Palmetto over Citra Blue? Because it has it has more positive feedback from uh, as far as some of the communities that have been using it already. They're seeing better results from uh, Palmetto than with Citra Blue. And I know at one point uh, Citra Blue, which, I, which was developed by the University of Florida, had to go back to the lab because they had to be retested because there was some some uh, contamination on the lawns. So it, they were getting false negatives or false positives on it. So they had to put it back out to test, which I they believe that's the reason it was, you know, set back on that particular species. Now there's, you know, the farms are making, selling it also again. Okay, so Citra Blue is still not the best option Versus Palmetto, at least so back and you know they the they've gone back from it. A lot of people seem to be transitioning over to Palmetto. 
Okay. All right. Really, that those are our last two questions. Is about why you know why palmetto versus citra blue because it looks yeah citra blue looks like lengthwise and visually, except for being darker, would blend in better with what we currently have here. Yes. And and this is a this is preference. It all goes down to preference. You know why do some people want zoysia? If, right. Even though they know that it's going to be more maintenance, and it, it's, it all goes down to pre whatever works best for that community and that application. Uh, they they all have their strengths and weaknesses, just like floor tam does, and now has a huge weakness. <laughs> so yeah. The, there's a big con against it right now, so every community would have to you know make that recommendation for themselves. Um, uh, you know, even sourcing it, maybe, hey, how, how hard would this be to source? Maybe, like Javier mentioned, Citra Blue isn't as readily available, so that might drive the price up. So it's just uh, making the, making an informed decision, you know, just collecting all the data, doing more research on their own, and, and figuring out what, work, what works best for not only the application, but that community themselves as well. Right. And then how do you, I know you, your specific company has dedicated crews to each of your sites. So it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit different. What if there's associations out there that have a vendor that services their property and they do not have dedicated crews and equipment to their particular association? Is there any, I guess, how did you discover, or do you know the origination of wherever it came from on your properties that you currently have? So is there any way to track it back? I guess, or is there anything the associations can do there, or is it just make sure or ask your vendor if they're using precaution? Yeah, so what our our communities are are generally larger on-site communities, and there are a few of the smaller crews that go from site to site. So what we're taking, what we're doing is following the protocol, the recommendation from the University of Southwest Florida okay. is it's cleaning our, blowing off as Javier mentioned, uh, going that extra mile. Uh, and that's why we're bringing it as well to your attention because that's something that the managers can go to their landscapers and see, well, how are you guys handling this? You know, what are, what's your protocol? But as you mentioned, maybe there's, if you have a, a community of 500 homes, maybe one or two people bring in their own vendor, outside vendor, just to service, you know, what are they doing and what are they using as precautions? That's something that the board or the landscape committees would have to discuss, you know, amongst mm -hmm. themselves. How, how do we want to handle this moving forward? Is this something that we want to address, you know, with other landscapers coming on property? Because, uh, you know, we touched on it with landscaping equipment, but it can also be power washers you know, walking on, you know, bringing equipment, dragging hoses uh, across your grass because it doesn't have to just be cut. You're just breaking the leaf blade. So a, a lot of it does, you know, come into play with who are your vendors that you're bringing in? How are you, how are we going to manage this moving forward? Okay. And how do you, how, how do we, how do they confirm the cases or how, do we know how many number of cases are in Collier and Lee County specifically? I know of Lee County specifically, there's six communities in uh, Gateway District. They currently have it. Okay. Um, in Lee County, in Collier County, uh, just because I'm not involved as much in Collier, uh, I know of, I know that it was confirmed. I don't know the exact location in Collier. Okay. So more than anything, be aware. Um, ask if your landscape company is using preventative measures and... Um, and keep an eye on it so you can write it, you know, at least kill it before it spreads further. And I think out of all this, I mean, it's basically just, you know, being uh, attentive to the, to the symptoms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, having them, you know, visual inspections, which is going to help uh, at least to be able to identify the locations. Yep. And that's the best practice to have regular weekly, at least for us, weekly you know, landscape inspections to go and look at everything to see if you see anything that's off so you can address it and be proactive versus reactive all the time. Yeah. How fast does it, how long does it take to get a sample back once you've sent it off? Uh, seven days. Okay. Well, a lot can happen in seven days. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's good to know. Um, any other questions from our attendees? 
None coming in. That was all good information. Again, um, I, this has been around a long time. I had not heard of it uh, because it hasn't been present here in Southwest Florida. So I know when I spoke to my team members on the other coast, they were very familiar with it um, on the East Coast. And, you know, everybody seems to be handling it over there, being proactive. And then, as you said, replacing with a different type of grass. So thank you guys for the information. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We appreciate it anytime. Yep. And I'll be happy for the attendees. I will be happy. To, I'll be sending out um, this presentation so you can share it with your landscape committees or property managers so that they can just be aware again of what, what's out there and just keep an eye out. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you, Javier, for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, guys.